very much. Uh, yeah, so it's nice to be nice to be back. <laughs> I, uh, I'll stop bouncing around uh, soon. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm delighted to talk about um, this experiment, um, Agpol, and future experiments that we're doing here. Um, this has been a project that I've been working on for a number of years, but it's been a Princeton project for all those years, and it's a project. ACPOL that's, that's, that's run here in Princeton and, and, and huge numbers of uh, students, postdocs and, and faculty are involved in this project. So um, uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a local thing. So uh, what I want to, I want to talk about some of the questions that we're hoping to answer with better measurements of the microwave background and in particular the polarization of, this, of the microwave background. And the first thing is, uh, is this, you know, Perhaps a simple question, but I'm not sure it is, which is, is the currently most popular model, Lambda CBM, for the universe, is it actually a complete description of the universe after the first fraction of a second? Obviously, there's some more complicated things happening, but is it, is it the right thing that describes, um, describes the, the sort of macro properties of our universe? And just as a, as a reminder of what it is, it's a, it's a model where the universe is geometrically flat, it has a cosmological constant, and the physics is described by general relativity. And the contents are purely uh, baryons, uh, some cold dark matter content, um, neutrinos and photons, that's it. Um, and the initial features in the universe, the initial fluctuations that were put in at early times that have evolved to become what we see today are rather simple. They are Gaussian, um, they're adiabatic, which means that when you initially put in fluctuations in the early universe, you put them in the same in all the different kinds of particles that are in the universe, dark matter, neutrinos, photons, etc. Um, and the initial fluctuations were almost scale invariant, which means that you have the same size features on large scales as small scales. Um, and you know, this model is doing phenomenally well at describing uh, our data, but right now there are a couple of kind of teasing hints of things being may be different, but um, nothing that I think would yet convince me that it's broken yet. But I want to just highlight a couple of them because, um, you know, they're interesting. One of them is, um, excuse me, is the measurement of the Hubble constant. So we measure the expansion rate of the universe today. We can either do it by assuming lambda CDM is correct and taking microwave background measurements from the early time and predicting them forwards. And we get this prediction that's like around 67 um, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Or we measure it locally with Cepheids, and we get a higher measurement. This is Adam Reese's team. We get a higher measurement of around 73, and it differs at around three sigma. Now, three sigma isn't enough to say, right, it's all over, break the model, start again. <laughs> um, and certainly, there could be systematic effects going on in both measurements that could be uh, affecting that. Another curious thing, again, it's just this is just a, a sort of two sigma discrepancy which again is not enough to, to go home and start again, is the amplitude of fluctuations today, sigma eight, amplitude on eight megaparsec scales, and the fraction of the universe of energy density in matter, uh, and measurements locally of the large scale structure from galaxy lensing prefer kind of slightly lower values of this down here than you'd predict if you took the, the Planck CMB measurements and extrapolated them forward. It's a little bit off, but it's, again, it's, this is a two sigma difference. So um, I, I don't think, you know, it's, it's Lambda CDM is not broken yet, but we better check, <laughs> we better check and, and keep exploring whether it is. Because there are all these things about it that we don't understand yet. And those are the things that we can hope to ask about sort of beyond this, the simple model. And that's I kind of split them into what I was like physics and astrophysics, although, you know, there really isn't. I, I sort of do it for a joke because I'm now in two departments, and I, but I don't really think there is a difference between these two things. Um, we want to know what the physics of the neutrino sector is. We think there are three neutrino particles um, that have perhaps the minimal mass we might expect um, uh, given neutrino oscillation measurements. Um, we want to know if that's true and what the physics is of this sector. We want to know what physics describe the initial expansion of space. We haven't got a model for that yet. We've got a theory. Uh, is, it, is it inflationary expansion or is it something else? Um, is accelerated expansion of the universe just lambda? Is it just the cosmological constant or is it something else? And there are other questions that we can ask with micro background data. 
about where the baryons are in the universe on, the, on large scales. Where are they compared to the clusters and galaxies we can see? Where is all the gas? Um, and how and when did the universe reionize? Now, those are things that other data have perhaps a bigger impact on, but we can answer some of those things with micro background data. So until, until now, the kind of big steps we've had in the last um, uh, you know, 15 years or so have come from these two satellite experiments measuring the microwave background. So doubly map, it's been a big project here in Princeton. Um, and then most recently, the Planck satellite, which uh, is now wrapping up its sort of final analysis and stopped taking data a few years ago. And with both these satellites, we've been able to make these, um, you know, beautiful maps of the CMB temperature anisotropy over the sky. They're measuring the same thing, different color scales, but the same actual features, just with higher fidelity measured by Planck. And just as a reminder, this is just a, this is a, ca a snapshot of part of the universe as it was at 400,000 years when it transitioned from being ionized to neutral. And we're capturing the, the temperature of the light at that time. And we're looking at fluctuations of a part in a, a million around the mean temperature. And we're seeing the, the colder regions in blue, the hotter regions in red. And those temperature uh, anisotropies are more or less tracing the density irregularities in the universe at 400,000 years. The universe is almost completely smooth and featureless, but it had little features, and they had, it had these tiny features that we're seeing kind of represented across the sky. And it was those tiny features that then evolved through to become the large-scale structures we find today. So this is, we're seeing the, the beginning of it. Um, and how we then extract information from that, which we'll then we'll be doing with, with polarization too, is our favorite thing to do, the, the, the best statistic we really have from the microwave background sky, this image of the universe at 400,000 years, is to take the, um, the, that map and to compute the variance in the map as a function of angular scale computing its two-point function. Because assuming that the fluctuations are most pretty much Gaussian, that contains all the information in it. So we basically, de so we take it, we take the map of the sky, you see this little image, this little cartoon here of taking a CMB map and decomposing it into increasingly smaller scales um, and saying what's the variance as a function of those scales. Um, <coughs> and um, shown here is, is the, the variance measured from that map from the Planck satellite in blue and also supplemented with these green and, and red data points taken from the previous generation or first generation of new ground-based experiments that I'll be talking more about, but um, ACT, which is our experiment here in Princeton, and the South, South Pole Telescope. And, you know, the data, as it's been collected more and more, it just fits the curve underneath, which is the Lambda CDM prediction, kind of extraordinarily well. I don't think any of us would have expected it to fit <laughs> so well. Um, and what we're seeing over my, you know, not, what we're seeing in these features is, uh, is the evolution of density fluctuations evolved through from some initial fluctuations put in at you know, time zero evolved through to 400,000 years, which is where we capture them in the CMB. And so out here on, and we split it up into these very large scales and small scales. Out here on large scales, we're looking at uh, loads of fluctuations that are so big that they were beyond the cosmic horizon when the CMB formed. And so we're basically, it's kind of featureless here. We just see constant power here. But at these smaller scales, you see these, the, the peaks and troughs, the acoustic peaks. And that corresponds to what's happened to initial fluctuations between time zero and recombination, which is that you put in some initial uh, irregularities and the baryons will tend to collapse over densities, but the photons that are coupled to the baryons in the ionized plasma will tend to oppose that. And you set up sound waves in, in this early universe. And the sound waves travel through the, the ionized plasma 
and different wavelengths will have reached different, different points in that evolution when you capture them at recombination. So you see this is a series of acoustic peaks uh, that correspond to whether you had more or less uh, amplitude of your sound wave when you capture them at recombination. Um, and and the fi you know, it really is extraordinary, I think, that this, the underlying curve is this six-parameter lambda CDM model. It's got three numbers that describe the contents of the universe. It's got two that describe the initial fluctuations, just an amplitude and a scale dependence. And it's got one kind of extra number that describes when the universe reionized, which is kind of, a, in a way, a nuisance parameter for, for early universe cosmology. I like it too, no, <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> for the purpose of what's going on early on, it's, it's, it's not describing um, those early on things. Anyway, right now, no, we haven't found a model that fits better. The chi-squared is good. There are some, you know, curiosities like this dip here. Um, <laughs> uh, but right now, nothing fits better. Um, and, and we've also kind of exploited now the temperature anisotropy or the primary stuff coming from recombination. We've now measured it, right? There it is. We can't do better, even though the error bars out here are pretty big, you can't do better out there because those are the largest scales in the sky and you just have limited modes. You cannot, you cannot, you, you've only got one sky. So we'll never do better out there. And the data is pretty fantastic all the way out here. What are the different pictures? These ones. These are just what, um, what the universe, what the CMB map looks like on different angular scales. Um, and so you break it up into the angular scales and say how much signal do you have at different angular scales. So what's, what, what do we do, what do we keep doing now to learn more? And what we, one of the things we do, there's a couple of other things we do, is we look at the polarization of the CMB light. So, um, so you can imagine we've been measuring the intensity of the photons coming to us, but we can also measure their preferred orientation and degree of polarization. And you actually, we expect the CMB to be polarized because, well, you can only get a polarized photon coming out to you if you have scattering of free electrons and a particular pattern of, of scattering where you have, for example, hot light coming in this side or two sides and cold light from up above and below, like a quadrupole pattern. And if you have that scattering in off the photon, then when it comes out towards you, it'll be net polarized in this direction. Um, whereas if it was isotropic around or even a dipole, it would come out to you unpolarized. So you need this particular quadrupole pattern. Um, and it gets set up, you get that, that um, you get those conditions during this little epoch when the universe was becoming neutral, during recombination. You have free electrons and you have this, this quadrupole and it's sourced by the velocity perturbations at recombination in the photons. So you can imagine that the photons more or less, it's not quite right there. The temperature anisotropy traces the density of the photons um, at recombination, and the polarization is more or less tracing its velocity. <coughs> <coughs> You'll also get polarization generated, you get this pattern generated if, in addition to motion of things happening at recombination, you also have a gravitational wave passing through. If that was ex in existence, then that would also generate a quadrupole, and that would also generate polarization. Um, you can then generate polarization of the CMB again, so the universe starts off ionized, becomes neutral, and then later on becomes reionized again. And when it reionizes, you generate polarization again at that point because you've now got electrons and you've got the intrinsic, the, the, the CMB itself, scatters off the electrons at, at reionization. Um, and, this, and the polarization also, the another effect that you can that you, that's that's there is that the CMB. Uh, light gets distorted by gravitational lensing around all the large scale structure and that shifts the position angle of all the light and at that, that changes the angle of polarization, distorts the lensing signal, I'll go, I'll go into that in a minute. Anyway, so we measure, typically what we do is we'll measure the amount of polarization in the light with um, a Q-Stokes vector like this and a U-Stokes vector like this but then we decompose it into these different patterns of polarization, E modes and B modes, where E modes are the polarization pattern that's either pure tangential or pure radial, 
around any point in the sky. And beam modes are pure, um, the pure curl-like signal. And we do that because the different physical mechanisms produce the different produce different um, different patterns. Um, perturbations or uh, perturbations at recombination that arise from just velocity perturbations around overdensities are pure E modes. Imagine you've got things falling into overdensities. It's purely uh, uh, it's a purely radial effect. You don't get any kind of any curl. But if you've got gravitational waves passing through, they don't care <laughs> whether you've got what their source, you know, they don't care about falling into things. And you get both kinds of polarization patterns, E modes and B modes. So that's why we like to split them up into those two things. Um, it varies. So at small scales, it can be like uh, 15, 20%. But at large scales, it can be much, much, much smaller. So it's, um, it might be a percent or so or smaller. So um, I, I won't spend long on this because a lot of this I'm not going to be talking about today. But um, what's left to be measured? <laughs> There's actually a lot left to be measured. Um, and also, where to, how do we measure it? Because the next phase of the CMB, we haven't got a Planck coming. Right? We haven't got a Planck Mark II anywhere very near the horizon. We're going to be doing a lot of the next stuff from the ground. Um, but some of it we know we can't do from the ground and we'll have to go back to space for. So the things that we can measure from the ground are a better measurement of this polarization and isotropy from the recombination era. And we can also measure the lensing and isotropy in the CMB uh, that I'll show you in a moment. Um, but we can make a map of, of how the CMB gets lensed um, around the large scale structure. Using both ground and space, we can look and certainly if we found something, we, I think we would need ground and space to, be, to make a convincing measurement of a polarization signal coming from gravitational waves. And using, I think, space alone, we could make a measurement of the polarization from reionization, or a convincing one. So I put P if it comes from polarization. There are also these neat other effects that we actually need better temperature measurements to look for, which are these um, kinetic and thermal Sinier Zadovich effects coming from the kinetic effect comes from the motion of baryons uh, in front of the CMB, and that induces a dipole effect on the CMB. And you can use that to kind of measure the, yeah, the motion of baryons later on in the universe. And then the thermal effect comes from uh, the scattering of electrons in clusters from the CMB, and that shifts the spectrum of the CMB, and you can look for clusters and measure the, the gas in there. Um, and those are... There's a lot more that can be done with that that just make involve a better temperature measurement at higher resolution. Um, but I'm not going to be speaking about those in, in more detail today. There's also this very neat effect, which is you can actually look for distortions to the initial black body, to the black body CMB spectrum, which actually shouldn't be perfectly black body. It's like the best black body we have, but it's not shouldn't be perfectly black, black body. Um, and if we can measure the actual the, the spectrum of the CMB better, we could look for effects that actually come in before recombination that distort the, the spectrum. But I'm going to focus on the polarization ones. Um, so one of the things that we'll be aiming to do better on, but, but there's already been you know, neat progress, is this measurement of the lensing anisotropy in, from the CMB. So the CMB gets lensed around large-scale structure. And so it gets to any, the temperature in any given direction gets distorted by a given angle, giving it the gradient of some lensing potential. And you can sort of reconstruct, using maps of the CMB, you can actually reconstruct what did the lensing and reconstruct a map of the lensing potential. And that's been done over here by the Planck satellite, um, where what we're seeing is the, a map of the lensing potential, which is rough, which is basically an integral of the matter between here and last scattering, weighted by uh, you know, the kernel of how, how much a given position would contribute to a, to a lensing signal. One or two, redshift one or two. Yeah, one to three. Yeah, it's kind of halfway back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, yeah. And so you get this map where actually, the, where it's blue, right, you have slightly less matter in that direction than average. And in red, you have slightly more matter than average. 
Um, and this is a map that we'll get that we'll sort of get better and better data from. Um, and you can, like with the temperature anisotropy, we can we look at it, the variance of the function scale in that. Um, and that gives us this current measurement, which is variance of the function of angular scale, shown in here, where the, the boxes are the data points from Planck, and the green and the blue are uh, measurements from our first generation ground-based telescopes. Um, and, and that curve is lambda CDM, <laughs> um, and it fits right now, fits very well. And it's a view of the late, it's a view of the universe at redshift one or so, which is another handle that brings you from red, from combination to redshift, to lower redshifts. And again, it didn't have to fit. You know, there were different, different models that would give different, different lensing signals. Sorry? Um, there would be cosmic variance. And then measurement error. Yeah. Sorry. Oh yeah, that's a very it's a good question. Yeah, if you change just like with the lensing signal, if you went down if you think about the sigma eight omega massa plane, if you went down that way, you would lower that lensing signal overall. You'd lower its amplitude. Yeah, actually, it, it's yeah, it's actually lies. Um, if you think about that lensing banana for the and and, and the Planck one, uh, the, the C and B lensing one kind of lies in between. Uh, you know, take from that what you will. It's not, <laughs> it's not that. It's not as far off as the as the galaxy lensing one. It's not. It's a little bit lower. Yeah. Good question. You do it by so. Just in this, assuming that we have no foregrounds for a moment, we do it by looking at for the coupling of different Fourier modes, different length scales. In the primary CMB, there should be no coupling between a large Fourier mode and a small Fourier mode. They just evolve independently. But, this, but the lensing, if you lens around a structure, you couple together neighboring modes. And if you want to reconstruct the lensing and get a given scale, you look at all the pairs of differences of you look at uh, sorry <laughs> pairs of modes with differences of the length you're looking for. <laughs> so if I look for a length scale like this, I look for all the pairs of modes, Fourier modes that have that as their difference in scale, and that and I construct an optimal es an optimal estimator that 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 gives me that. That's right. So the two so the lensing map is based as a two point, so a, a coupling of. Yeah, exactly. Four point. Exactly. Exactly. The four point. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that changes it. Yeah, quite a lot. That changes quite a lot. So we want to make, and so also Planck have also measured the polarization and isotropy, and I'll show you the, that data along with ours um, shortly. But where we're now moving to is beyond pl beyond Planck this program from the ground, which has been up and running for a, for, a, for a good while, but is now kind of really expanding. And so this is a site that, that we use here in, in Princeton. It's the Atacama Desert. Um, it's one of the two best sites for observing the CMB in the world, which is the Atacama Desert and the South Pole. Um, and so we operate on this little plateau here. This is Alma down here. Um, so it's, sorry? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and Steve, you feel it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, sorry, uh, five thousand two hundred meters. Sorry, I should know it in feet now that I've moved countries, but that's <laughs> that, that that high. And um, right now, we have these three telescopes in operation in this in this site. One is ACT, which is our telescope. Uh, then the Simons Array, and this new one called FAR. Um, and it's really developed, the site has really developed as a, as a great location for be doing CMB measurements. Uh, San Pedro's down that way, so yes. You can't see the ocean. No, it's quite, it's, it's reasonably far up. It's, um, it's right by the Bolivian border. So you're, you're a little bit over from the, from the coast, not on the coast. 
So this is a, a slightly deeper zoom in on, on ACT, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, um, which uh, has been in operation since 2007. So what you see here is the six meter telescope, a custom built telescope um, made of aluminium that's shielded inside this, this ground screen, that's shielding it from contamination from, from the ground. Um, and what you're seeing here is, you know, that's very, very important. It's a generator <laughs> to make electricity, <laughs> perhaps the most important part of the whole thing. Um, and and office, office space in the shipping containers. Um, and yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a huge Princeton project. So the first, the way it's, we've used the same telescope for nearly 10 years now, but we've had three different generation of cameras inside it. The first was MBAC that ran for, for three years. And then we had ACT-POL, which was running for another three years until just the end of last year. And now Advanced ACT has started just this year and is running for the next, the, the coming three years. Um, and so with being six meters, it's got about arc minute resolution. And Lyman was the PI of it for the first two stages. And now Suzanne, um, I don't know where she is, Suzanne um, Staggs is now PI of this current stage. And there's a ton of, as I said before, there's a ton of students and postdocs uh, very busily working on uh, making this work uh, in Dadwin and a lot of uh, students and postdocs in, in Peyton Hall working on analysis and, and theory. So this is a, a big local project. Um, I want to just show you some, new, uh, some of our new data. Uh, where have we looked? This is now a map of the sky in RA and DEC um, and the big solid regions are the regions we looked at with the ACTPOL instrument. That was our middle our one that's just finished. Um, we chose bits of the sky to look at that were clean. So the red stuff is dust emission from the galaxy. We tried to avoid that. And we tried to also spend a lot of time on the equator where there's other wavelength observations in particular from HSC and BOSS. Um, and then we also spent a little bit of time down here, but less time down there. And so we just put out a paper last week with which used about half of our first two years two years of data covering this patch here. Um, now the following year, 2015, we had an awesome year with twice as much observing and more detectors on the sky. So we've essentially actually analyzed about 15% of the data that good data that we have in hand. Um, but you know, analyzing the data takes a while and so we wanted to push it through and see, see what we had. So let me just show you a, a, a comparison on just a little snapshot. These are degree scales of the sky. So this is kind of five degrees by about nine degrees across. This is a snapshot of just the temperature fluctuations in the CMB measured by Planck uh, and ACTPOL. So, yeah, so, <laughs> so Planck, I'll go back and forth. Right, so Planck and then ACTPOL. So what you should see is that the features in the CMB are the same. <laughs> they are correlated, we did check. Um, uh, but your, but ACTPOL has higher resolution arc minute rather than about five arc minutes. Yes, that's right, noise. Yeah, exactly, that's noise, yeah. And then in ACT, so you see it's higher, you get the high resolution and, and better no, but lower noise. And you also see popping up, um, these are point sources of the gala galaxies, um, AGN and dusty galaxies in the red spots. And then these in blue are galaxy clusters showing up with the thermals and the Erzadovich effect because they scatter the CMB spectrum and they show up cold at 150 gigahertz, which is where this is taken from. Yes, you see, yeah, because that's a point source. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. And then here now I'm showing you the full 500 square degrees um, of the CMB map in temperature and in Q and U Stokes parameters. This is now anisotropy in the polarization. Um, there's two types of polarization, so Q and U Stokes parameters. And you'll see that it looks kind of less noisy here and here because we spent more time observing there. So it's not just your eyes. Um, those are deeper and less noisy. Um, and what you should also see by eye is that the Q pattern does look like this, right? And the U pattern looks like this. Um, you see it? Yeah, you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> that one, that one looks like this way, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. 
So it should do. What that tells you is you're seeing by eye an emode pattern. Okay, and the reason for that is that emodes, an emode pattern uh, might look like this around any given point. Um, and that means that it has uh, Q type polarization here and here, and U type here and here. So you should expect to see Q, dominantly Q, uh, here and here predominantly you here and here, which is why you see this pattern, is that would be like an E-mode type. But a B-mode type polarization, you'd have a curl-like pattern uh, like this. <laughs> I can't draw it properly. I'm trying, I'm trying. There, right? And so that is U there and Q here. So if this were actually a B, if we were just seeing B modes on the sky, we would see this pattern flip. We would have seen Q looking like this and U looking like this, right? So you, just by making this map and seeing this pattern, you say, I see a signal and it's an E mode signal. It would depend, the way we filtered it, so, so if, if your CMB, it may be not answering that question, but if your cosmological signal was very large scale, predominantly, then I wouldn't be able to see it like this here because I'm seeing a signal that is on this kind of scale. But the, but the theory signal has power out, out there. I'll maybe show you the power spectrum to show you why you, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it, we, we understand this is just our scan pattern. So we don't use this stuff, obviously, for cosmology. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry. <laughs> uh, we just want to get all the, you know, get our dirty laundry out. This is what you have. If you only s observe the sky in one direction, you, you get noisy. You get a noisy map. You need it in both directions. Yeah, so we only use, we cut it out in um, uh, the stuff that's, your noise would also be super high here. So even if you were, you shouldn't include it. But if you were to include it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, wouldn't do as much. Um, uh, no, um, but you do. Your eyes would, your eyes would see it more. Yeah, when it, it's, we noticed this. You know, when when we have noisier maps, your eyes pick out you more easily than Q because you get the scan scan pattern. Yeah. Um, and so then you can convert it, then we convert it into E mode signal and a B mode signal. Um, and the B mode is, that's just noise you're seeing here. Um, yeah. We actually, do you know what? No, we're not actually. In polarization, we're not, because in polarization, we've got almost no point sources. And actually, we have just one there that we can see. It's polarized. <laughs> yeah. So we can filter them out, but we didn't here because we only have this one. And, um, but we are filtering out large scale, very large scale modes where our maps are noisier so that you can see the signal. We don't think we have galactic, significant galactic emission that dominates on these scales. So we estimate at these frequencies, these frequencies, these scales, um, we don't have the, galac the galaxy is negligible here. I'd have to look at it again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks, Eve. Um, so here's, here's what happens if we then take those maps and take the and take the power spectrum, take the variance in those maps. Okay, and variance is a function of multipole for both the temperature map by itself, or the E mode map by itself, or the cross correlation of the two, the Q and the E. Um, and we're comparing here the Planck data in blue. I didn't show you the maps in Planck, but Planck has made these measurements in the blue data points, and ACTPOL in the red. Um, and so one, you should notice a few things. One is just to point out 
that the E mode signal is out of phase with the P mode signal. So we have the peaks here, we have the troughs here. And that's basically because the E mode is more or less tracing the velocity perturbations and the temperature is the perturbations. So they should be out of phase. Um, and um, and you know, all of them look rather consistent and they are consistent for, to you know, a chi-squared test with this underlying gray curve, which is the Lambda CBN model for the three different curves. Um, and you get this correlation, you expect to get this correlation, and we've seen it for years now, between temperature and polarization because it's the same mechanism that you're tracing. It's the same recombination physics that you're seeing in both, both the probes. And so Planck does better at large scales because it's got the whole sky. And just actually comparing the fraction of the sky, this is Planck is using maybe 70% of the sky, and this is using only 1% of the sky with ACT. So, you know, if we spend longer and go wider, which we are going to, like, this is, it's going to get better for us. <coughs> this is nothing, this would not have gravitational waves at this stage. This is purely E modes. So this is the signal that we'd expect just from recombination. Um, no, without gravitational waves, because this is not looking at B modes, and we don't actually detect any B modes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, la so, so pushing to, to larger multiples, to small scales. That's a good point. Um, in the in the B modes, actually, which I'm not shown here. Yeah. So B. So Planck is. Yeah. That's. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. All that. B, that's right. So you don't need to go down lower in E. Yeah. Um, so uh, the thing that one wants to do first with this, these data, and because this is just kind of this our, our early our early sort of data set, we're not able to say something truly compelling at this stage about what what model is right or wrong is you've got three different now, three different measurements of the thing that should agree, right? They should all give the same cosmological model. Um, and what we found, so we, what we did was we estimated the cosmological model from our three different uh, estimates of the power spectra, from the temperature, the polarization, and the cross correlation. And what we found is that we've just reached this transition point where the CMB polarization data is now becoming better than the temperature at doing cosmology. And this is a trend that's going to just keep going and going. The polarization is just is better, <laughs> right? It's, um, the reason for this is, I'm actually going to just go back to the spectrum. Uh, if you just kind of even look a little bit by eye, the, the peaks in the E mode are more pronounced than the peaks in the temperature. And that's because the temperature has this combination of density fluctuations but it also has a slight contribution from the velocity perturbations as well. And that kind of smears out the peaks and makes them less peaky. <laughs> and um, the features of the E mode are so much more pronounced that if you can measure it, you get better constraints on, on parameters. Um, now, but because the E mode signal is smaller, you have to get good enough noise to start reach getting these benefits. And we're just seeing this, beginning to see this now. So I'm just showing you the comparison of the baryon density, and the acoustic peak angle that you see the CMB peaks at, and the Hubble constant, measured either with just ACTPOL temperature, or the TE cross correlation, or the E mode spectrum. And all of these, I picked these out three on purpose, <laughs> these three are all best in TE, better than in TE than in TT. Now, they're not better yet than Planck, because you need the large scale signal to really give you a full model. Um, but, um, but it will soon be the case that even combining with the Planck data, that the polarization will be the best constraining. Um, and also it allows you to check for consistency. And I get one of the reasons, yeah, that right now there's, again, I, I mentioned tensions. There's kind of a two sigma tension between some of the models estimated from like small scales in Planck versus the large scales. So if we can measure these small scales in temperature and in polarization with a different experiment, we can try and see if that's, you know, is the Hubble constant really 67, or is it, you know, is it something different? Yeah. Yeah. 
that's because this is not including the large scale data from Planck as well. This is just what we measured from ACTOL. The errors are broader than when you add in the large scale Planck data as well. So, well, it's kind of pulled, it's pulled both ways, right? So it's, yeah, it's a combination of, it's a good point. It's a bit of both. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, in temperature, that's right. That's right. You get the higher Hubble constant. Yeah. Um. <coughs> that's right. Yeah. Oh, it's the he primordial helium fraction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is yeah. So this, um, this is. You're not assuming it's actually anything, actually. You can normally in the standard model, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so if you change that, you just change the salt damping. So, so you can just tune, you can tune that knob and, and you just more, yeah. Exactly, uh, Zach's working on this right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, it, for simple models, I'm not sure you get the much better constraints. But for more unusual models, which are not ruled out, I think we this should this should be better. So yeah, I hope you'll find that more. This is just showing it's not we're not doing much better yet because again, this is just a small part of our data. How parameters that affect the damping tail of the CMB, including the number of neutrino species and the helium fraction, get squeezed by adding this new data. But this is only adding like 15% of our data. This should squeeze significantly more when we put in our full data set. And it's an interesting number. The number of neutrino species is interesting because we don't know if it's three. Um, there could easily be additional um, relativistic species that exist that were produced in the early universe that decoupled before neutrinos that could give some different number to this. Um, so that's an idea. So, you know, right now we're about to embark on <coughs> analyzing our full data set and learning more about the damping tail and really just checking whether what we've seen from Planck is right. Um, and that's, and, and, and checking extent, you know, things like the neutrino properties as well. But what we're now embarking on now in terms of data is advanced act, which is running from now for another three years. And there we're going wider um, with five frequencies of observation. Um, and we're covering this large region, 40,000 square degrees, in the red uh, outline, plus 14,000. Yeah, yeah, no, not 40. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these deeper regions in white covering uh, a few thousand square degrees. And the two big things that, that that lets us go for are, the first is neutrino mass. So we've got three neutrinos, we think, and we'd like to know their mass, and we know that it's at least a minimal mass of 0.06 electron volts because from oscillation experiments, oscillation measurements, we know that the masses have got to be at least that much. But we don't know if they're a normal hierarchy with two light and one heavy or one light and two heavy neutrinos. And so it's either at least 0.06 EV if it's normal or 0.1 EV if it's inverted. Um, and we can hope to measure the neutrino mass with CMB data and with other data too, through looking at the effect <coughs> on structure formation. So structure growth is suppressed when you have a higher neutrino mass because, and this shows the fractional effect on the matter power spectrum, the percentage change in the matter power spectrum, the fractional change as a function of angular of scale. All at the sum of them, actually, we get to see we the sum of the masses. Yeah, we should see all of them cosmologically, unless there's anything weirds going on. We should see them all. So it should just be the sum of the three. Um, and so, at large scales, you see no effect, but you see a suppression of structure growth at small scales if you have a higher mass. And that's because if you just imagine fixing the total amount of dark matter, dark matter plus neutrinos, if some of that were in neutrinos, 
then early on it, the trees would, would be free streaming and would suppress structure growth compared to if they had been cold dark matter all along. So if you move some of the neutrino, some of the cold, some of the dark matter from cold to neutrinos, you lose a certain amount of structure growth compared to the universe that had just cold dark matter. And the higher the neutrino mass is, the more suppression of structure you'll get. And CMB lensing is great for measuring that because we measure the growth of structure and we measure it early enough on that things like dark energy shouldn't be too much of an issue, although we still have to worry about it. Um, and so by making a higher fidelity map of the CMB lensing than we've seen from Planck, um, with advanced stack, we should be able to get errors on the neutrino mass that are about 0.06 electron volts with this wide survey. Just for comparison, that's about half the current error because currently we have these upper limits um, from the lensing power spectrum combined with the baron acoustic oscillation peak positions that put us at about 0.23 electron volts at 95% confidence. This would half that, and it wouldn't, with advanced stack, that wouldn't give us a detection if the neutrino mass is minimal. But if it's inverted, it would kind of give a, you know, an interesting hint. <laughs> um, um, uh, so that would be from making a better lensing map um, of the CMB. And the reason you can do that better with polarization is that lensing turns an E-mode signal into a B-mode signal. And so you can look for this pattern of signal that wouldn't be there normally. Uh, and so it show pops up as a, as a signal that, that normally is not there if you don't have lensing. Uh, it doesn't matter, we only constrain the total sum of the density. So we're not, we wouldn't be able to answer a question about what the, dense, what the relative contribution was. We would say you had um, uh, we just take a total relativistic density yeah, and then turn it into a mass assuming that it's a certain, a certain model. Yeah, because you couldn't tilt that you would, you'd tilt, because this tilts the late time matter power spectrum, but it doesn't tilt the primordial CMB power spectrum. Right? So it would, you'd, need, you'd need a bend, and then it wouldn't show up as a bend in the primordial signal. Yeah. To be honest, it's the, tri the bend is actually not, it's not the, but most of the problem is that data, the data, we never get to measure this stuff, really. We really measure that. So actually, what we actually have to worry about are other things that just cause suppression, which are things like changing the dark energy equation of state, changing the curvature. Those things do actually matter, and they, they all be a bit generous. So. Going to foul. Yeah, absolutely foul. <laughs> Much more said. Uh, I'm racing, sorry, I should race through. The other thing that we would, that we'll be trying to check with advanced act is whether, um, whether we see any signals of gravitational waves that we might expect from inflation. Um, and so, currently, even by, by no means uh, a favorite of everyone, <laughs> inflation is uh, quite a popular scenario. Um, and, um, you know, the, the idea is you get inflation driven by the potential of some, some scalar field. And for, you know, if you assume very particular initial conditions and a very particular potential, you can predict what um, tensor and scalar fluctuations you might expect to get. Um, and those gravitational, the tensors propagate as gravitational waves and they show up as B-modes. And so we look for B-modes and then put a constraint on what the tensor scalar ratio could be. And that could all, that could correspond, if we manage to see it, that might correspond to saying what the energy scale of inflation might be. Um, right now we have this limit from the BICEP2 Keck survey at the South Pole, that's this limit that R is less than 0.07, which actually already rules out um, so some simple, potential simple models of inflation. Um, and we're targeting, you know, an error on R that's a few times lower than that uh, with our advanced stack survey. And this would be by measuring, again, polarization over, the, over those deep patches of sky and looking for this B-mode pattern in the signal. Uh, yes, exactly, we will. So it will hit, but, but it's also, we wanted to go in two regions so we could look for foregrounds, check for foregrounds. Um, 
broader coverage spatially and in wavelengths. Yes, that would be, that's where we, we, we sort of feel like it's a, an advantageous over a small deep region to use that for. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'll get some blood and sugar. <laughs> so, uh, ooh, sorry. Um, so this is what we're doing with Advanced Act in the next few years. But we have these kind of further goals with CMB, which is to actually detect the neutrino mass and to actually push down the B mode level to a level that would kind of exclude really huge swathes of inflation if we didn't see it. So down to about R of 10 to the minus three. And to really go sensitively enough to detect some deviation in some three neutrino species. And to get, an, among other things, <laughs> to get there, we need to do something that we're calling CMB stage four. So we're kind of at stage two with ACPOL, stage three is advanced ACT, and stage four would go up from like 10,000 detectors to like 500,000 detectors. And to do that, you can't use one telescope and you can't just use one small collaboration. And we've realized as a community that we have to all come together, the different ground-based experiments, in the, uh, particularly in the US, but also internationally, and form a kind of mega collaboration where we do this analysis and we do the telescopes and the detectors together. And that's kind of breaking away from the tradition here of smaller CMB experiments working in competition with each other. Um, and, but the kind of the, the scientific targets in terms of the science we hope to get to, you know, in terms of an error on the, uh, on the 10 to the scalar ratio, a detection of neutrino mass, you know, make it, <laughs> make it worth trying to, you know, uh, um, figure out our cultural differences and collaboration. Oh yeah, figure of merit. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, figure of merit. Yeah, how good W not W is. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, I would say a little bit, but not fully yet. So we just finished writing a science, the first version of our science book for S4, where we in included a bunch of things that we knew to be troublesome, like foregrounds. Um, but I don't think we fully included all our systematic effects. So I would say that, that when it, that target really is targets, I think we haven't, in the next year or so, we'll define what we actually think our achievable numbers are going to be. So half, 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 yes and no. Um, and the idea is that you would bring together these telescopes in the Atacama, which is our site in the Atacama, with telescopes at the South Pole, which include the South Pole Telescope and the BICEP experiment. And these collaborations would work together, develop common detectors, um, within also the framework of um, DOE, who are eager to support this, um, and basically work together. And um, I, I think it's, I think it's going to happen. I was initially uh, I'm, I'm going to I've just said this before, but I'll just say it in words and skip past. So the big things would be yeah, getting down to a level of, of B mode limit that was really interesting in terms of either detection or ruling out a lot of inflationary parameter space and to detect the neutrino mass, to really go, go measure it. Um, but so the part, we, I feel much, uh, much more optimistic now that this is really gonna happen, partly because we have made now a path to doing CMB stage four, uh, particularly in Chile, which is, which is in the form of the Simons Observatory, which is a big new front project that Princeton is centrally involved with, which is uh, now a five year program starting now that's funded at the kind of $45 million level by the Simons Foundation um, and universities to push forward the science we need and technology we need to do this CMB stage four experiment. It's already involved the merger of two of our CMB teams, so ACT and Polar Bear. Uh, we're now working together to design this new experiment. And that's actually kind of a big deal for moving ahead because as I said, we've all been quite culturally separate in terms of the different experiments and coming together is, is, um, is important. Um, and so we'll involve site infrastructure in Chile and the Chilean site in particular, um, technology development and basically starting the S4 process together um, as a big project. So we're doing a study phase right now. And we could imagine, for example, here are our telescopes now that exist. We might imagine putting new ones where the blue ones are, with uh, in, on the same site, leading up to the full stage four experiment, which could take uh, this kind of form of, of, of multiple, sorry, I'm gonna, ah, sorry, I'm gonna skip. Anyway, 
multiple new, new sites, because you'll need a lot of different, different telescopes in those sites, and they might be different sizes. So we're deciding what that is right now. Uh, I knew I would run out and not have enough time to say everything. I'm just going to say one thing about space and Pixie, which is that we can't do everything from the ground. There are a handful of things that we cannot do from the ground with a CMB. Uh, sorry, I should have done the second one. <laughs> and that is measuring the very largest scale signal on the sky, both the E modes and the B modes, um, and measuring the actual form of the black body spectrum of the CMB. You can't do that from the ground because you haven't got enough frequencies and you can't see the larger scales from the ground. And so um, there's a proposal underway for the Pixie satellite to launch in the, in the coming decade as well that would fill in this gap. It's a, it's a small telescope, so it's only two degree resolution. It won't do the small scale stuff, but it allows you to do with you know excellent systematic um, uh, handling the stuff that you cannot do from the ground. And if we don't have that, we won't be able to, for example, uh, just by measuring tau, actually, you can halve the neutrino mass error and go from a two sigma measurement to a four sigma detection, just by measuring the large scale E mode better. So among other, there are many things that make it uh, you know, compelling, but that, that you just cannot do uh, without, without space. Um, so um, it's, it, we do need it um, in our kind of, in our, ensemble of new experiments. Okay, so just to summarize, the CMB polarization is now getting to be better than, polar, better than temperature. Um, there's tons of exciting science to be done um, and real things to definitely be measured like neutrino masses. Um, and the path to doing this, I think, is this ground-based observation suite of experiments coupled with low-resolution satellite data. And there's a ton of it's gonna be happening uh, yeah. in the French Centre.